Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode four, four. of Onegano's Let's Talk Water. Um, so today I'm super excited to um, introduce our really amazing youth. Um, and guests. Yeah, and our guests and our scientists. Um, For our science minute. Yeah, so the first. So obviously, you know us. Me and Makasha. Yeah. And our guests today are Victor, and he is um, co chair of the GIYC. And our second guest is Piers, and he is Enoch from, um, where is he from? He lives in Toronto right now. So he lives in Toronto right now, but he is. And grew Enoch. up in Hamilton. He grew up in Hamilton. And then our for our science minute, we will have uh, Christine. And let's start the show. Are we going to do? Yeah, the, uh... our first. First of all, we're going to start off with a video, and it's going to be um, an Aquasasne water song video. And that will start shortly. Water song. <laughs> I don't know more. 
happened to the sound? I believe our sound cut out, but that was my um, bad for saying um, that it was Akwesasne Women Singers, but it's actually um, an Idle No More song that was presented at um, in DC at a Standing Rock event. And there were so many different people there. There was West Duty, there was um, Taboo off of- Black Eyed Peas. Black Eyed Peas. Um, and there was so many other amazing artists there. And that was me who filmed that. So I'm sorry if I didn't get the best quality image, but I really think that import, that song's important um, of I Don't Know More. And it starts us off good with what we're gonna talk about today. So um, I think it's important that we introduce ourselves again in case we have any new viewers here. So Sego Makashingyets, Gini Gahaga Nigo Honjore, Wakatuhuni. I'm Makasha Looking Horse. I am a host here um, and I'm from Six Nations. I'm Lakota and Mohawk. I'm a um, Indigenous Studies in my under, I'm taking Indigenous Studies at McMaster University in my undergraduate there. And I work for Oneganos Water is Life for the past three years as a um, youth. I forget what my title is exactly, but I do all kinds of different things and work with a whole bunch of people on our team. And this is my co-host, Dexter. Yeah, I was kind of uh, so greggy. Uh, um, so good to see you all again. Um, I'm Tanadakwe, or Tanadakwe means uh, he carries the entire town in uh, the Cayuga language, it was an old. Um, name that comes from the Sour Springs Longhouse and that's in Cayuga but I was speaking in Anadaga and I'm 24 years old uh, Cayuga Nation and Wolf Clan and I'm one of the community members on Guajomes here uh, volunteer a lot of different places I've been um, a part of uh, the culture all of my life when I was growing up all I knew was um, Longhouse I thought everybody in the entire world went to Longhouse. But anyways, <laughs> I work at uh, Guyana State. I was a cultural interpreter there. I worked inside this um, 16th century Longhouse. And I was basically the resident um, Indian, so to speak. <laughs> People would uh, come up to us. I met people from all over uh, the world, all over Turtle Island, um, as far as Japan, as near as um, my neighbor. Um, I talked to everybody, talked to everybody the same. And I was just a resident teacher, basically. It's basically what I am, is just a teacher, um, a guide. Um, I just help people. I've been doing that my whole life. Yeah, so a few things that we're going to talk about today are um, the UN and climate change. And we have speakers that are going to be talking about that, but I want to share a little bit about my experience and how it ties to here in Six Nations and what Six Nations youth have done um, and traveled to the United Nations. So, so I was about 13 years ago, um, we there was um, youth from South Dakota that traveled from, sorry, there's a fly in here, um, that traveled from South Dakota to Six Nations um, because we had a lot, they had a message and they wanted to join, wanted to join us here in Six Nations because, um, because if we join together, then our nations are stronger, right? So they met with us, um, they met with, they met with um, our faith keepers and um, clan mothers and chiefs, and they came up with a declaration 
that had tons of different things in it like land and um, water and murder and missing indigenous women and they they knew that this would start a movement and there when they were bringing their message these youth said that hey like i want to um i want to take this message and go to um go to go to unite bring it to the united nations and let it be heard at a whole um panel and um and so 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 they said that they well when the youth when the south dakota youth came they came on horseback and it took them four years that's a big important part but it took them four years to get from south dakota to six nations and they were on horseback and they ran and bring in that message. And it that's how long it took them was four years to get it here. And so their message was heard by our community. And the youth here um, said, I'll take, we can run this message and we'll go together to the United Nations in DC. And by the time they got there, um, it was World Indigenous Peoples Day at the United Nations on August 9th. And, um, and they had, they ran there and my dad was supposed to do a pipe ceremony inside the United Nations, but they said no, um, which didn't go over well with him, but they said, no, you can't um, do a pipe ceremony in the United Nations uh, on in World um, Indigenous Peoples Day. So, um, so, but he couldn't make it anyways. And so he, said my daughter will do it and so at 10 years old I'm here um, in this picture the little me <laughs> um, Babe Kosh. did um, and in this other picture that was all the youth from Six Nations the older looking one and the yeah um, beside my baby picture but <laughs> <laughs> we had um, so I did the pipe ceremony and that was the first time for me doing any kind of pipe ceremony and I was like okay this is my responsibility to take um to do these things that my father um does so and that's a really huge deal so she's just talking like it's no big deal but it is a huge deal so all of these really important people had to go outside and I did the pipe ceremony there and um and our message was heard. And since then, there's been a lot of good change. And what's really remarkable that how I is, well, how GWF like opened up these doors um, and taking a role in your community opens up doors. And um, that's how I met Victor, who is one of our guests. Um, because I went to the United Nations for um, a side table to present about the work that we do here in Six Nations about our water. And so I showed um, Galbanillo is um, a youth, as a school that our project works with. And they, um, Galbanillo Immersion School, and they did digital stories. So I went there and I showed their digital stories about water. Um, and why water is important to our youth and how worried they are about water. So those digital stories are actually on our Facebook page and you can view them if you want. And, but they, I presented those stories to the United Nations there. And while I was there, I actually met Victor and that's how I got this other opportunity. Um, he nominated me to um, yeah, you know, well, he like learned about all the work that I do here in Six Nations, but also um, like with Nestle and taking these um, and he knows that like I'm also like a Sundance leader for the last 12 years of my life. So that's kind of how my passion and how my way of life is really how I got into the activism work because since I was 12 years old, I've been praying and 
um, wanting a better future for our youth because from a young age, I knew that our um, environment is not healthy. So I, so what sun dancing is, is not eating or drinking for four days and um, praying and basically sacrificing yourself um, for the people and for the land and for what you believe in. And so that's what I have done since I was like 12 or something around there. Um, and so that's where really, I think all of this really started for me um, was cause I did it every year. I like, I prayed about those things. I prayed about each blade of grass that it would continue to grow and that our medicines will always be here and that our, our waters will flow healthy again. So like, so for me, this had, this work has been um, more of like a way of life and um, yeah, I guess that's how I could explain it, but they, but he, I guess he knew that and he nominated me um, when I was at the UN. And so that opened up another door, which I was able to do another um, pipe ceremony for the cli climate youth climate change um, summit that the United Nations had and Greta was there and all of these really important people. And I would got the opportunity to open up those ceremonies, which was really cool. Um, so what I did there, I did, a, I did a pipe ceremony inside the United Nations, which was a huge deal. And that's my other picture, the updated one. Um, because my dad wasn't allowed to, right? So me um, having the opportunity to do a pipe ceremony inside um, for climate change was, was really meaningful um, because, because all kinds of reasons really, but like I wanted to, I wanted to bring a real ceremony for these because I knew there's a whole bunch of important people there who can really make important change for globally because it's the United Nations. And so what I said there um, and what a pipe ceremony is, is bringing our minds and our hearts together and that we can move forward in this case with um, having solutions and working together to fight against climate change um, as one mind and as one heart. And I said that this wasn't a show and this wasn't a um, like a like a prop, like I, I, this was a real ceremony and I wanted real change and I wanted, um, this is like, a, this wasn't really, I don't know. It's not, wasn't fake, it was real, you know? It wasn't just a demonstration or a show. It yeah. was a real ceremony and it had actual meaning. So if you were there present in that time, I'm pretty sure you'd be able to feel it too. Like it also brings a, a certain resonance when it's done. Yeah. correctly and, and we, respectfully and it, yeah that's really important that we have these opportunities that's why i'm so thankful for victor who is um a co-chair for the global indigenous youth caucus and he's um he is a F fulbright well he is dakota and he's yaki and, and he's his he wasn't I don't know if you want to explain it more, Victor, but you didn't, if you want to tell us about how you became into this role of becoming a Harvard student, of becoming co-chair of Global Indigenous Water, or Global, what is Indigenous it? Youth. And Global Indigenous Youth Caucus, and you do all these kinds of different, different kinds of amazing things, and you're a Fulbright um, scholar, correct? No, you're a Fulbright, yeah. which is super impressive. Like you're, that's basically like a world scholar. I don't know if people understand how awesome that is. That, yeah, you got that opportunity, and here so, you are. Uh, Victor, uh, can you introduce yourself since we've sort of introduced you already? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to Victor Tayak. It's just um, a greeting and Yaki, I have the Yaki flag behind me. And uh, I'm just really, really thankful to be here. My name is Victor uh, Machil in Yaki, uh, which means scorpion. 
And uh, like Makasha said, I'm also Dakota. And uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, I was, I was, when you were talking about the ceremony in the UN, uh, I have to say like, it was really powerful to be there, especially as a Dakota uh, youth uh, sitting there, you know, with all these politicians who were talking about climate. Um, and where, you know, it was the first time that they had sage burning, you know, in the UN General Assembly Hall. And um, I think it was just a really powerful moment because uh, when like our ancestors first tried to go to the UN, they didn't let them in because it, it was it was created for nations. And uh, so they went to the UN because they said, OK, we're nations. And uh, the UN didn't allow them to enter the building. So the fact that Makasha was there uh, doing a pipe ceremony, I think, just was really powerful. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm really happy I got to witness that. Uh, as far as like the UN and getting there, I think at first it was like, it was, it was just uh, kind of luck, I guess. I was in my freshman year of college and I was just playing uh, I was away from home, you know, I grew up uh, in Tucson, really close to my Yaki heritage, you know, always going to ceremonies, really involved in my culture, uh, and really just ingrained, and then it was the first time I really went away, and I, I was pretty sad to, to be all the way from home, and I was just like, oh, I want to find a, something to do that where I can connect back, and then I got a call, uh, and it was... Uh, the UN, they were inviting me to speak uh, about water issues, actually, that were affecting my tribe. Um, uh, uh, pesticides were being pol uh, polluted, um, polluting our river in Mexico. And so I talked about that, talked about our health, and then I just got involved from that point forward. And I, I kept going. Uh, it was really pretty convenient because I went to school in upstate New York so the UN, of course, New York City, it wasn't too far. So I just decided I would continue to go and keep trying to stay involved. And this youth caucus, I think, was really helpful because it was the first time I really got introduced to indigenous peoples on like a global scale. I always thought before then, like when I thought of Native Americans, I was like, OK, this is just like Mexico, United States, Canada. But I didn't necessarily conceptualize like, you know, like the Maasai in Kenya or you know, like the Chittagong Hill tracks in Bangladesh being pretty much uh, exactly similar in terms of that they are indigenous peoples. Of course, they have different cultures and stuff, but they've been on that land since time immemorial. Uh, and I got to meet all those people. And it's just really inspiring the fact that all of a sudden there were you know, hundreds more of millions of people sharing in the same struggles of colonization. And the fact that we could come together like that and really support each other on an international scale, that's kind of what, what drew me, especially because I come from growing up a tribe that crossed the border. Um, it, the Yaki tribe, we have like a reservation in a few communities in Tucson. Uh, we also have eight villages in Mexico where a lot of my family are from. And I always felt like that border uh, really harmed our people. And it was almost like uh, when I was in the US, it was really difficult for me to explain that to, to Americans, that Native Americans are also in Mexico. And I finally felt kind of understood in a way uh, when I met all of these other indigenous peoples from other countries. So. Uh, that's just a little bit of how I got involved. Yeah, I could understand that struggle. We have to deal with it every time we go across um, a, a Canadian and American border. I just don't understand that those aren't our borders. Six Nations goes across the land and those are imaginary lines to us, but to them, you know, it's a big deal. So it was almost intentional to separate us, you know, like how they say divide and conquer. But we have some more uh, questions for you here, Victor. Um, can you give a global perspective and why it's relevant to water and Six Nations? What is that supposed to say now? 
I think that, that we can um, give you another one if you don't fully understand that one. Um, but do you have any slides that you want to present first? And I can. Uh, I brought some slides just in case. We're, it's it's been made basically on COVID nineteen and kind of some of the stuff. I've yeah. Been doing, so but. yeah. So maybe tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing currently. Uh, because we know that you're doing awesome work with COVID-19 and Indigenous communities. Okay, do you want me to do the slides or do you, do you want me to just talk about it? No, do the slides so we have some visuals. Okay, I, I think you have the slides. Okay. Um, but I have a video that I sent. Um, it's, it's a short video that we made. To, it's it's kind of going to give a global sense of uh, it's uh, indigenous youth, we came together and we made this video uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And we're speaking in our languages about um, how to respond, essentially. <laughs> I know, I missed that boat. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> Just imagine <laughs> me. I do a lot uh, of- Yeah, we, you can go ahead and play it. Okay. Oh, yeah. kama vijana kutoka jamii ya asili virusi vya corona ama covid-19 vinaonekana kuwa hatari kubwa sana young people are not immune we can carry the barriers and the lives of all elders are the risk when kanki na tankanki at kia wo unkie we show you happy hana wo lokota you have upi o we chakia we help our elders by running their errands for them and picking up necessities so that they can avoid crowded spaces. Um, we chop their wood, they use seeds for them to plant, um, as well as asking them to share stories either over the phone or from afar. We find creative ways to support them while protecting them from exposure. ตมาวีเอมีบาบูบาตะจีเอโอรีเนมิตาสุบินิโกตรุนีกองจัมมาชิบายะลาโลจมารุกีตะไซมีเนมาเรตรุมาคันนากูเรยปูนีเดคันซ
So that's why I, I put this photo there. Uh, we, favorite seal skin vest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can go to the next slide. This wasn't the first year I went, but it was, it was a couple of years later, I stayed involved in it. Uh, so at the beginning of this pan pandemic, uh, being at Harvard, you know, I thought, you know, this medical school needs to do something because uh, they, you know, they're doing all these things and, you know, they often forget indigenous peoples in medicine. And uh, so I was like, you know, I'm just going to mobilize something um, with the resources I have there. So we started this uh, initiative where we brought together a bunch of medical students at Harvard, some from, I think, University of Toronto and indigenous youth with the Youth Caucus, and then a bunch of indigenous um, rights leaders. Go to the next slide. So we uh, pinpointed all these partners and they joined in and we essentially set a bunch of goals that I'll get into later of how we were gonna help. Uh, and, and this is all pretty much virtual because uh, we didn't really have the resources to you know, go to communities and we didn't really want to because uh, it was, it was kind of dangerous and a lot of communities of course shut down their borders, rightfully so. So we can go to the next slide. So these are some of the advisors we had for the, this initiative. Uh, so we had a, a bunch of physicians. Most of them are indigenous, which is really cool. Um, I feel like a, uh, a lot of times uh, there are physicians who work with indigenous peoples, but we wanted to make sure that we were getting indigenous physicians to advise us. Go ahead. And we partnered with seven global communities um, some of these partnerships were, became really fruitful. Some of them were kind of experimental and they didn't really re require some of the services that we were offering, but it was really cool because, you know, about three or four of them, we were really able to, to make a difference. Uh, and the rest, uh, we, didn't, we didn't need to really do anything, which I think is, is, uh, was, was kind of cool at the same time because it meant that they were doing really well. Um, so we, we partnered with the communities from the different UN regions. Uh, and you can see them here. Uh, the San Bruno from Africa, the uh, uh, community in the Pacific, Navajo Nation and, and Hopi in the US, uh, the Ulchi peoples of Russia, the Wayana in Suriname, which is in South America, and Chittagong Hill Tracks in Asia. So these are some of the things that we decided we were going to do. I think one of the main things that we uh, that's become really successful is translation of COVID-19 materials into indigenous languages. So, you know, when this pandemic started, we, the CDC released all these guidelines and stuff, but they were not applicable to indigenous communities in many ways. So like they were like, oh, wash your hands, go get water, and not every community even has water uh, or running water, which you know that just goes to show how guidelines like they're not really tailored to us, but also culturally, you know, a lot of them were like, um, if you can't see your grandparents, call them on the phone uh, or Skype with them. But a lot of indigenous communities don't have the access to those things. So how, how are they supposed to connect with their grandparents in, in these contexts, like in a village context, for instance? Um, so we also like published articles with the UN about what our partner communities were facing we helped fundraise, um, we put together webinars with the different UN agencies. Uh, we got together a team of doctors who were, who were giving technical guidance to the community leaders from different parts of the world on their response to the virus. Uh, uh, and they were indigenous physicians, which was key because uh, again, they, they were able to have that cultural competency in a way and then just advocating for indigenous populations in Boston. Go ahead. These are some of the language examples. We put out a call for indigenous translators and we got uh, over 150 from you know, all different communities all around the world. And this is the, um, the greatest, uh, as far as I know, the, the most robust uh, uh, group of indigenous translators ever gathered and most diverse. They come from um, you know, over 40 different countries. Um, and so these are some of the examples. Uh, most of them came from, are coming from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Go ahead. 
So it's just an example. Uh, I don't know if you can play it, but uh, well, you don't you don't have to play it. We can go to the next slide. Uh, this is another example. So we had the indigenous physicians and Harvard medical students and indigenous youth make the translations. So they were culturally and contextually relevant for indigenous communities. And then the translators, um, we got grants to pay them honorariums. So we were giving that economic stimulus. Uh, so they actually got paid for their work and they translated these materials and we're launching a website very soon. And we're gonna try to expand it to other health information. Uh, but as of now, we're just focusing on COVID-19. Go to the next slide. These are some of the webinars. You saw we uh, had webinars with UNICEF, the World Health Organization, Envoy on Youth, International Fund for Agricultural Development, uh, which was key for us, like just getting the word out there because I think a lot of indigenous peoples have been left behind in the media as well and in these conversations. You go to the next slide. Uh, we did local advocacy. Boston initially they created this task force for COVID-19. They left out native populations. So now we got native populations included on there. You can see down there it says uh, Asians, Blacks, Latinos. It used to say and immigrants, um, but now they added Native Americans and Indigenous people. And uh, I was ended up uh, being nominated to serve on the city's task force to represent natives there. So that's been really rewarding um, to get kind of that urban context. Next slide. Then we did fundraising. Uh, we've raised over $4,000 for various indigenous families around the world who are struggling uh, to pay for like electricity, to send their kids to school. Um, some of these funds are gonna be used for gas to bring physicians in, to educate on the virus, uh, just a bunch of different things. And we're supporting the communities that we uh, originally partnered with. Next slide. Uh, yeah, and I already kind of talked about that. So that's kind of an overview. Recognize a few of those people. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Who, who, uh, who do you recognize? That girl in the purple dress. Yeah, that's Carissa. Uh, yeah. Yeah she, um, yeah, she worked with us on our GWF and she applied for the leadership. Um, do you know what it was? That's why you guys were all there. Yeah, I remember I, I saw her when, we, uh, when I went up there to your territory. Yeah. And she well, she has the twins, right? Yeah, the cute twins. Yeah, she has twins so now, cute. which is really amazing. And her family is full of girls. She has like lots of um, girls as like her siblings, but then like they have girls and then now she has two girls, which is crazy. When we say, you know, like when things like that happen, you are... Um, the wealthiest people around because you have all girls you don't have um all boys well she has one little brother well this is what i mean <laughs> all girls in the family is that you're wealthy is because your lineage is going to continue more and more you're going to um, strengthen your clan your side of the tribe because we're a matrilineal society okay next question Beautiful. um can you tell us about the research guide you created for the sioux community oh I didn't actually create one. That's kind of what he um, went over. I was assuming that, I, he, I mean, because Akisha um, on our last call, he said that he translated some words for you um, in Dakota. Yeah, we're trying, we're trying. Um, he did, he translated some, which was great. Um, but yeah, that's in progress. So we haven't made it yet. So is that some of the work that you've been doing at Harvard or is that um, GIYC um, work? I kind of blended both because I felt, honestly, I felt like I had to uh, in order to be able to do what I did. I just like, okay, I'm going to bring in everything, like use what I, what I got. Um, because yeah, at Harvard, like, uh, I, I want to create a difference there that maybe will last even until after I graduate. So I'm trying to bring in as much as I can, you know, 
Mm -hmm. How has um, your experience at Harvard been? Uh, it's, it's, been, it's been really good. I've been learning a lot. I'm excited to finally get to my clinicals and uh, mostly I'm just excited to, to become a physician so I can go back to my communities. I think that's what, what's driving me forward. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Harvard. How are they treating you there at Harvard? <laughs> they, I don't know. I mean, they don't have any, they don't have very much experience with natives or indigenous peoples or I'm, I'm pretty sure they never had a student like me. Uh, so like yeah, during the, definitely. during the pandemic, I had cultural obligations and things like this. Um, they weren't like, I had to like get extensions on some exams and stuff and they didn't really understand any. Um, anything that was going on and so my tribe ended up having to write them a letter explaining some of the cultural things uh, and they were like they were shocked they were like you know we've never heard about any of this and uh, so I think that's just one I think vignette that they I think hope I like to think I'm teaching them a lot um, and hopefully making it easier for future native students who won't maybe have to deal with all of that and maybe you won't have to explain themselves like when they have a ceremony or when they need to be with family um, what was that process like like getting into it can you tell us a bit about like your journey and to getting into harvard uh yeah yeah i mean i just studied a lot uh <laughs> like, <laughs> I, so it's pretty much it like i just put my head down and i was like okay i need to do well um um, trying to, you know, be a good role model and uh, make a difference. And so to get in there, I just felt like during my undergrad, I just really had to put my head down and study all the time. Uh, but I think maybe I did an on, also a non-traditional path because I did a lot of advocacy and activism mm -hmm. uh, as well. And I think they saw that too. Uh, and they knew I was, you know, what I wanted to do and why I wanted to be there. Uh, so, have I, you? Yeah. Have you? Um, like, can you tell us a little bit how, if you like try to harmonize indigenous medicine, um, and into Western medicine and how the, how that paradigm is? I would like to. Uh, yeah, but I'm. I mean, I don't come from like a medicine family. Or, you know, I don't have that knowledge. So, uh, I mean, I think it's something that is maybe like I would like to see happen, but I, I haven't personally been doing it because uh, I, I just don't have that knowledge. But, you know, I see myself uh, as a future physician. Obviously, I, I'm going to, you know, try to bring in that stuff. Like, let's say, like, if I have a clinic, um, uh, in Ocheti Shakoan somewhere one day, you know, I would have um, like words on the wall in Dakota or, you know, um, maybe I'd be able to send my patients to medicine people for certain things that I know that they might be able to help with uh, or, you know, try to create some synergies, I think, uh, that maybe Indigenous peoples can't find in like a Western physician's clinic, you know. Um, you think and, it's the relationship yeah. between you and the patient yeah yeah that's huge uh so i mean i'm trying the way i see it the more i learn about my culture the better physician i will be to mm -hmm. my you're patients more, yeah you're more of a, a relatable face you're more of a person they could trust because you know we look like each other you know it's not somebody else that's like sort of talking at us because in our ways of um, believing in medicine and practicing medicine, uh, the people are the doctors. You know, they tell you what's wrong. And then uh, the medicine people, all they do is just help because it's a really a personal thing when we um, practice medicine. You're, you, um, the person, the patient themselves has a lot of responsibility in healing themselves. And the, uh, like the medicine person, they are like sort of the guide and they show you how to do things correctly. They're just really knowledge keepers in our in our aspect, anyways. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, I yeah. totally agree. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to lead. You know, the way I, if I can lead 
uh, by example, you know, live a healthy life, like you say, heal myself, uh, show, you know, native youth that you can be healthy, you know, like I, I stopped drinking, uh, you know, no longer smoke uh, marijuana and stuff like that, things that I used to do, I haven't um, stopped doing that stuff. And I think, uh, yeah, that's also part of it because I heard that, you know, the medicine people also led by example um, a, in like a cultural way as well, like on how to be healthy. So I think that's something I'm trying to do. Yeah, yeah and that kind of ideolo ideology is definitely hard to fit into a Western institution or Western paradigm, especially one like Harvard. And I think Pierce can relate to that because he's he lived in Hamilton for a long time and um, he went to one of the top schools. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, Pierce, if you want to talk about um, your experience being an Inuk in, um, especially in Haudenosaunee territory mm -hmm. and <laughs> dealing with us all the time. And- I'm a little nervous um, laugh. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think um, it was really special uh, to spend a lot of time in Hamilton. Um, just a bit about my journey. Um, I'm originally from Inuvik. I was born in the, in the Western Canadian Arctic in the Inuvialuit region. Uh, so the most Western Inuit region in Canada. Um, but I was raised in the greater Toronto area down here in the South away from my mother's family, which you know bears my Inuit um, heritage. Uh, so, Thanks for collecting these and uh, and putting them up. Um, I never really had Inuit teachings in my life. So the fact that you mentioned that I grew up, you know, largely around Haudenosaunee land um, was really special to me because I got to learn about uh, teachings from other peoples and how they might be similar uh, to the traditions I still hope to learn about my own people. Um, and you mentioned like going to school abroad in London, it was it was pretty weird in, in that regard too, because I think similar to Victor, there was just no real experience with indigenous students. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe we can get back to that more later um, if you want to proceed. I'm sort of rambling on here, but. Yeah, I just wanted like the, the audience to know that this, the Western into in, uh, really good institutions is really hard for Indigenous um, people like yourself because they haven't um, had to change their ways in a long time. And um, so I wanted you to maybe tell us um, how you, how did you come to work with co-creations of Indigenous water quality tools? Yeah, uh, if you want to, maybe if Hannah could put the slides back up, it sort of helps describe the journey a little bit. Um, Hannah, can you put up for us, please? <laughs> Thank you. It was, it was really wonderful. I think um, my journey at Mac started off just sort of like any sort of like contemporary society. I just wasn't in touch with my, with my heritage, my Inuit heritage, right? Um, I actually dropped out of Mac um, after my second year to just sort of take a step back and figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and when I re-entered Mac, I went to uh, the Native Studies Department after um, working with Indigenous communities in my time away from school. And there was this professor there named Dawn and everybody's like, oh my goodness, you have to meet this Dawn. Uh, she's sort of been like this, this foundation of the department um, and I'm like, okay, this sounds great. Um, I'm really inspired to continue to learn more about myself and who I am. And just this person who has been a foundation at McMaster can really guide me on that path. Um, so you see on the bottom left and the bottom right, and I guess the top right as well, there is um, a photo of a bunch of students and we're actually down in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so how I came to Met Dawn is I did uh, a fourth year research course with her that was sort of about decolonizing research. Um, and that's where I think I really got to know Dawn and she was developing this idea for the co-creation of water, indigenous water quality tools. Um, I think we sort of, yeah, uh, she invited me to, to become, I think a part of this project, which is a really huge honor for me. and. Um, 
that's when I really got to know a lot more about uh, Haudenosaunee traditions and culture and life and uh, really build up my research resume as well. Um, so yeah, um, that's sort of how I ended up with you guys. That was, I think the first year of the grant, um, which was 2017, 2018. Um, and since then I've been sort of watching from afar and helping out if I can, um, where I can. And I still hope to continue to do that in some way, shape or form. Um, because I, yeah, I, I love the work. Yeah, definitely. That's kind of where I first met you was when we went to New Zealand, right? Kind of, or when I really got to know you when we spent two weeks together. Yeah, I remember you and uh, Samaya coming in to teach us these songs. Um, at the beginning, I think you, you were playing. Um, yeah, I just remember those great times, sharing our cultures with folks down in, in uh, Aotearoa, the Maori. Uh, it was a little bit of a cultural exchange in a way, which was really nice for us to learn more about them. And I think we, as uh, our nations and communities here, look up to the Maori a lot um it was yeah really special in that regard yeah so pierce oh, yeah. here actually learned some mohawk yeah. songs like the yeah. water song and the earth song and oh about it, the fire and the wind song just kidding <laughs> <laughs> and he know so you can like sing one right now if you want just kidding <laughs> Get <a little> <laughs> i got yeah. my rattle here um but i got no drum sorry <laughs> will help you. Um, yeah, so did you want to, um, so you worked closely in developing a decolonizing research guide. Um, can you tell us a bit about it? Um, and we're, mention that we're continuing to work on it. And you're building it up and maybe yeah. show the course guide a little bit. Absolutely. So I think when, um, you know, I first heard about this and Don mentioned this to me and invited me again to, to participate, uh, I was in grad school, right? I was um, studying uh, social policy in, in London, which you might see as like the, <laughs> the machine of modern colonialism, right? So it was really interesting for me to be in a department um, in a city that was sort of the cause of a lot of grief around the world. Um, and to be working on a project like this, just sort of, it, it made sense, I think, to be studying in a place like that and to help contribute to the, the decolonization of research and the academy, I think um, was something that was really great. And, you know, brought in partnerships with uh, with Orhe and, and Don and just various perspectives around what decolonization is. Um, you know, there's a lot of literature, you can talk about decolonizing everything, right? Like uh, decolonizing medicine, like uh, I, I'm sure Victor might be trying to do when decolonizing education, like we know a lot of folks are trying to do, um, and science more broadly, I think science can really be seen as colonial. Um, so you mentioned like it's still an ongoing project, right? Because this work never really stops. Um, it is something that needs to be continuously addressed um, and the learning uh, it never stops, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, when I was um, doing my work at um, Guyana State there, it was all about uh, medicine and reintroducing indigenous medicine to this to this area. And I came up with um, uh, the idea of ethnobotanicity. And then I met my uh, my actual cousin, but he's a dear friend of mine, uh, Gerdo Deer, and he was an uh, ecologist. And then he was uh, elected to do the... Uh, uh, ethnobotanicity at the uh, Polytech school and so when I was talking about this idea with him he looked at me and he was like what are you talking about he's like people just um, introduced that word to me and he was like trying to get me to teach him I was like I don't I just came up with the idea I didn't really um, think I was going to do it like so immediately but it was all about uh, taking all those aspects of western medicine and breaking it down to show like all that medicine comes from us like well the majority of it does like probably like 80 to like 90 percent of like um modern medicine comes from this part of the world's hemisphere like advil <laughs> yeah like advil advil is our medicine 
Oh, that's where they got the idea from, and they stole it and then patented it and sold actually, it, like, so. yeah, let um, it's called As aspartame, and it's um, it's it's produced naturally on trembling aspens, and you can go up to a an aspen during the the months of May to maybe late July, and they have this sort of coating, this powdered coating on the outside of the bark, and you can scrape that coating off and put it directly on your foreheads or like on, the, on any part of your body and it relieves that uh, that pain. That was a uh, part of our medicine walks that we did. We did a lot of research, me and Gerdo. There you know, was... I'm really happy that you brought Guy NSA up. I think another thing that really helped me on my journey was the Indigenous under Undergraduate Research Program at MAC that they put on every summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my favorite memories from that program was actually going to Guyana say, and you mentioned Girdo, right? I think he, you said he's your cousin. Yeah. But it just like this brilliant overview of essentially decolonizing that, um, you know, that field and that discipline. Uh, it reminds me of the book, um, Braiding Sweetgrass um, by yeah. Ruffin Alzheimer. And that just is sort of, I think, decolonization in a nutshell to me. I don't really know much about botany, but I can relate to you know the storytelling and the traditional eco ecological knowledge right mm -hmm. uh as far as we go you know we have our own you know our own relationship with with the land and plants um i again i'm not a botanist so i don't know them but i can certainly appreciate them and that for that you know it's one of my favorite books and guy and was one of my favorite experiences yeah yeah um and i was your favorite teacher <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, I'm the teacher here. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, um, I understand that because uh, in our way, like in, um, in our ways and how we um, understand the land, we always use familiar, familiar terms like the mother earth, grandmother moon, all the brother, the sun, uh, the stars as the ancestors and all of the plants and animals as our relatives or our cousins. And that, um, directly relates to our um, family as well. That's why we have such big families and we also know them as, you know, our cousins and our relatives and our aunties and our uncles and uh, from both sides of the family, from the mother and the father. And that's um, directly relates to our relationship with the land as well, because way back then we didn't have, you know, electricity, we didn't have um, uh, surgery, we didn't have, well, I guess we did have surgery, but it was different, you know, it was different but they, we always knew that they were there and they were given to us as a gift because we don't have to do anything to um, help them grow or for them to be there. It was always there naturally. And that's what we give thanks for a lot of the times in our ceremonies um, and our cycle of ceremonies. That's basically what we do. We come together and we uh, give thanks for what's there naturally and that we're still here, you know, and that we continue to see these things happen uh, more and more. And that's why women are so important is because they're able to um, produce life. And that's why they don't sing. You know, that's why they don't sing. That's why they don't speak in the longhouse is because they already do so much that, you know, they got to let us do something, you know, you know, because uh, <laughs> we just basically sit around the house, you know, uh, we go we, hunt and gather. Yeah, we go hunt, you know, while the women are in charge of, um, the land and the plants. Oh, this would be the perfect time to show that video that we made with Samaya. Me and oh, Pierce uh, made a video of like <laughs> me and me and Pierce made a video of him hunting for like us women and yeah, that's uh, that's actually a great story and how it fits into I think this overall narrative. Um, mm -hmm. I, we got to be part of a president's retreat one year and uh you know we were invited to sing but there were workshops that were happening right for a lot of the, like the deans and sort of like the more important people in the academy important people in the academy uh that doing was, a lot of the work right yeah that was for the mcmaster indigenous health movement conference and what we do is all about health is all about mentality but yeah that, spirituality. that was one of the breakout sessions and they're like explaining stuff and we thought like, okay, we're going to make a video. And like everybody else was just learning about it. And we actually made a really good video and we went outside and we, I fell from a tree just to get the capture of me falling like Skywoman did. <laughs> and 
<laughs> we made this awesome video. We went behind this like aquarium and Pierce had a little stick and he was pretending to get the fish for the women. Yeah, we were, we did an awesome video in like five minutes. And that's, yeah, the creation story, right? Storytelling within the academy. Um, and there are opportunities to do that. And if yeah. there are not, not opportunities, that's where, you know, people like Victor and Makasha uh, step up and, and create those opportunities. Yeah. yeah so so, uh, we'd how like you, to, so we'd like to bring Victor back into the How do you know Victor? Well. You know him from? Uh, yeah, I guess, again, through through work that was being done with, uh, with the United Nations and the Maori and just sort of all these relationships cross cross paths, right? Um, so I got to participate in the Project Access project, I think it was 2018, and that's where I crossed paths with Victor. And he and I met uh, down at the Permanent Forum, uh, where I got to learn a lot about how to effectively participate um, and advocate at the United Nations. So he and I met two years ago now. Wow, it feels like I've known you forever. <laughs> Seriously, like, I, I don't know, we just like connected um, before you got there. Uh, Pam, she's the one who like leads the program. She was like, oh, you're gonna love this guy. Like, I really want you to meet this guy. And, uh, <laughs> And yeah, I'm happy with that. I know you so well, Victor. I mean, not Victor, Pierce. Remember when you tried to go in where you weren't supposed to go and you're trying to get through security? I, I, do, oh. not, I do not remember that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. We won't talk about it then. But that's <laughs> Pam knows him from very cool experiences. Yeah. She, I think she told me about that. Yeah. Um, we, uh, it was just really exciting because, uh, we were there for the United Nations Ocean Conference, um, and the Maori were there, you know, um, advocating for, for their rights and sort of what's happening in, in their waters on the ocean. Um, and I think it was, it was really interesting for me as a, an Inuk who's really getting familiar with, you know, what being an Inuk means. Um, for me to go there and see advocacy happen at the international like level. So that's where I met Pam, who is the director of, uh, of this initiative. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I was invited back and she connected me with Victor beforehand to sort of help. I think Victor had been familiar with this work before and I, this was completely new to me. So Victor sort of was guiding, guiding me through the, uh, the week uh, or the two weeks there at the permanent forum. Yeah, and you, I mean, you did a really good, did you read a statement, right? Did you end up reading a statement? Uh, I, I don't think so, but. Um... Well, we, we like, yeah, this program, you know, they bring the people together and teach, essentially teach them how to effectively read their statements at the UN um, uh, and like how to draft them the right way. Cause you know, it's very colonial how the UN makes you deliver information there. Uh, and a lot of indigenous people, of course, come and it's really difficult. So this program kind of is something to help to bridge that gap while still like maintaining our cultural identities and stuff. They say like mm -hmm. the UN is the belly of the beast. It wasn't made for us. It wasn't made with us <laughs> in mind. So we go in there, we don't, they said the number one thing is don't, when you go to the UN, you don't forget why you're there and where uh, who you come from. You gotta overcome that system. Yeah. As long as we know the rules, we can go around them. How to play their exactly. game. Yeah, they're gonna get mad when we come in and we're better than them at their own game. <laughs> but uh, I would like to address the audience, whoever's listening. Um, is there any questions for our guests that um, you would like to ask? You can put them in the comments underneath the uh, video and we'll ask them, um, but um, I think we have a few more questions. Gosh, any questions? <laughs> yeah, um, Pierce, did you have any other um, slides that you want to show us? Uh, I don't think I have any specific slides uh, to show you. Um, it looks like <laughs> I, have, <you> have <laughs> I have what, sorry. 
Yeah. I have one more question. Um, do you, so we know that you went to a really good school and you've been going to the UN and you've grown up in um, Hamilton. Now you're in Toronto and now you've taken this new job that is totally different lifestyle. Do you want to elaborate on why you, why you want to, um, on why you're going to work, take this job? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'd love to talk about that. I'd like to talk about my current job first because I, I do love it. Um, so I'm working in uh, for an initiative called the Indigenous Innovation Initiative, uh, which is really great. It's sort of a new, it was a new shift for me going in from my from my master's to this world of um, social financing um, and, and grant making. So what we do right now is we're currently uh, giving funding to Indigenous women or, or Two Spirits or the gender diverse community to, um, you know, create opportunities for their communities and tackle big problems in their communities. Um, the whole idea right now we're working towards is advancing gender equality, so promoting opportunities for, for women or the gender community. But you mentioned the shift. Um, I'm moving up to my home territory, which is super exciting. I'm moving up in a month and I'll be working for my people um, working on a sort of Arctic um, research and data governance framework, among other things. So that's your job that you are in now? I'm, I'm shifting towards uh, the Arctic where I'll be working more in research and, and data science. So I think Don would be happy to hear this. Uh, I think it'll set me up really nicely for a PhD so I can uh, continue to do research and um, you know, hopefully teach somebody as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, are you going to be a professor out there? I think the long-term goal is to create a university in Inuit Nunungat, which is the Inuit homelands. Um, right now, there are no universities. Um, our friends or Inuit relatives in Greenland actually have university, but in Canada, uh, we're a bit far behind, and I think the University of Alaska actually has a campus at Fairbanks, which may qualify as, you know, the Inuit homeland. Um, but we're a bit behind the ball here in Canada, and that is something that is, I think, a project that I would love to contribute to in the next, I don't know, 20 to 25 years, whenever sort of Inuit and, and the governments uh, come together and uh, work towards this, this shared goal and vision. Um, that's awesome. I think we're going to shift into our um, next um, digital story. Yeah, our next presentation. So we're going to start off with a digital story first. And if you have, if the audience has any questions for Pierce or Victor of what they talked about the, at the UN, um, put them in the comments below. Put them in the comments below, and we can get to them. And after this digital story came. And so this digital story, um, it was made by the Gawaniyo Youth, which is the G Mohawk Immersion School here on Six Nations. And they actually, their school is actually on top of a ILA lacrosse arena. And so they don't have access to clean water in their classrooms. Um, they don't have a proper school. I went to Gawaniyo um, a while ago and um, when I went there, the school was condemning and, and so we had to move into an ILA arena, which we had um, no running water on, on top of an arena, which really is not supposed to be a school mm -hmm. at all. It's basically one hallway and it has classes that go from age like six all the way up to high school age, like 17. Yeah, all the way up to high school. And it's just one hallway with these rooms and it's not supposed to be a school. And um, so they have grown up and learning the language and um, learning our traditional ways of life and learning our ceremony and- How to connect it to the outside world really. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they're really um, lacking on a lot of different aspects of um, Western um, education. So it's sort of a, like they have to catch up at the end, um, at the end of their schooling here, they have to catch up with the 
uh, Western education on the outside. So they're actually accepted into like um, big institutions or outside colleges sometimes. Yeah, like definitely like for my for my personal experience, I learned Mohawk until I was like in grade seven or eight. And then um, then we transitioned into English. And so I only had those two years and uh, and then went to high school where it's only English. But this video is more about um, they made videos about how they feel about the water in Six Nations, like Mackenzie Creek, like Boston Creek, like the Grand River and how they're all like you can physically see that they're so polluted and so this is their them explaining their feelings of how they of how they feel and about our water in six nations and how that affects um and you can see like how that affects your mind mm -hmm. and your body and your spirit on a day-to-day -day basis because that is a part of climate change mm -hmm. that our water is polluted and that our air is polluted so this is their video that they made. up in the morning, drink a cup of water right away because it starts the cleansing in your body for the day. Tent window, a sun, don't hit, send your hoane, scout down, send your tent, a sword, the sire, a qui, a sake, sat on the nose. Here, go down, Hadoni, a negro, send, a gun hit, go on. Plastic is a big issue. Um, it's one of the big issues. Um, toxic waste is another. Like trying to stop all of that is, is it's it's a big job. But you know the youth are powerful, and I believe they have words to to say about their future. Um, I would be so great if they stand up for them and against those companies that are polluting our water. Kadino de Mahanda Hanzoni or Niganos Neo Hikoho. It makes me sad because of how people are treating our water. Um, but at the same time, I can also see the cleansing happening with the storms. So everybody talks about the weather changes, but actually my belief is that uh, nature is cleansing itself, cleansing the earth in its way. And it may take lives, but we've, we've been warned. We've been warned. we got to look after it. So just, uh, you know, you see all the floods happening. It's all cleansing, cleansing the earth. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think it's definitely something to discuss about when we, when we look at our youth that are going through our, going through immersion and they are going into these schools like Pierce and like, um, 
like Victor, they had they kind of struggled in like a Western paradigm, but also worried about climate change. And um, I did a film and I'm still trying to finish it, but on what that does to our to our youth and our mental health, um, carrying these burdens and that we have to fight um, then have to fight for these things when we shouldn't have to fight for them. Um, and that's like and it definitely takes an effect on your mental health and but it's definitely we're definitely resilient in these experiences and mm -hmm. um i don't know if pierce i know that um pierce do you want to like add in on how um resilient what you think resiliency is and how you put resiliency into your life or victor anybody want to answer that like what is resilience to you If not, that's fine. Here is um, Christine. Christine, and she is part of our um, team on Global Water Futures. And she is a creator, and she has been working with our schools, like Amy General um, at Galvanillo. And she's been in our community for a little while to learn about us and. Um, Christine, do you want to talk about more what you do? Sure. Hey, Dexter and Makasha, nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh. Yeah. Um, when you asked uh, Pierce and Victor about resilience, I think they've talked already about their joy of just connecting, even though they didn't know each other. And that's such a huge piece of resilience. And Victor say, talking about being at Harvard, just, you know, getting his head down and just studying, <laughs> like just that perseverance and using resources around you. And if you don't see the resources, make the resources. So all of you have done such an amazing job in just kind of making the resources if they're not there for you. And uh, I want to congratulate all of you. And so I'm going to be chatting about, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know, what I've been seeing in today's uh, session was so is so much joy and so much so many smiles, and uh, and that's what partly you know being real about the adversities or the challenges, but making sure you can still smile, and that's because you can smile because it's yours it's your smile to give, it's something you can do. So I have some slides that. Um, Hannah, our helper, is going to pop up. And uh, again, I'm happy to take any questions as well. If people want to follow up with me, um, my email is there, my two emails. I'm also at Dr. Weckerly on Twitter and Instagram. I just let you know that I'm a PhD in clinical psychology in the Department of Pediatrics at McMaster University. I'm non-Indigenous. My parents um came from Europe having been teenagers in World War II and I've grown up pretty much in around Toronto so we created this app as we were working with uh research on trauma and learning more and more the pieces that are you know where we could really help youth galvanize the natural resilience that they had and uh we developed this app called Joy Pop because we do want to put that focus on the joy that does exist uh, in everyone. And if anyone experiences stress or adversity, you're already into resilience um, because you are managing adapting. That's human nature is to adapt. And if I could have the next slide. So this is a really nice uh, piece of art by an indigenous artist. It's actually called PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. But when we look at it, we see so much hopefulness in there. And uh, there's just a bit on what's intersectional environmentalism. It's really bringing so many things together. The United Nations was spoken about. And uh, we are aware of these things called sustainable development goals. There are some for water and there's some for land. And there's some for peace and good government. 
and they're meant to work together. So uh, if you have a chance to read that and these slides will be available to you, you what you see is that you know protection is a strong uh, piece, but that looking up in that hopefulness where you recognize strength uh, from the animals and as well understanding that whatever trauma there is, it can be absorbed as the uh, uh, grandmother elder spoke, there is an, a process of cleansing and there's a confidence that mother earth or one's mother doesn't abandon you. And it doesn't much matter, you know, exactly what's in your invisible suitcase that you carry around with you. There are things like music and uh, um, nature and fragrance and sky and seas to support you. And what's important to know that when I talk about these uh, sustainable development goals, these are all based in rights that all the countries pretty much in the world have already agreed on. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child to protect youth on these kinds of matters. The, the member nations of the United Nations, the 190 plus countries have already agreed to do these things. Canada is a pathfinder country, which means that it has already said that it's gonna be about finding solutions. And so it's not a question of us agreeing because it's already been done. It's a, about doing things, being true to that agreement and taking action. Uh, so if I could have the next slide. So the global water futures and uh, as Victor talked about, you know, COVID can be, has been dis described as collective trauma. Why? Because not only was it like dangerous to your health or your well being, but it was that uncertainty, unpredictable. It, the information seemed to change all the time. And uh, for all youth, and especially for Indigenous youth who feel that responsibility as stewards of the land as responsible to the, the ancestors who came before them and to their the future generations, um, feel the uh, environment damage uh, very keenly and that, that can uh, come forward in terms of feeling more stress or anxiety. And um, what we're doing with the Global Waters Futures and participating with Six Nations is asking the questions, what information would be helpful to you and how do we take a trauma-informed perspective? What does that mean to acknowledge trauma and move, you know, you don't erase it ever, you just like a tunnel move through it, move forward. And um, there's a link to a video that, um, you know, McMaster students, um, in part because of Dawn's uh, great mentorship, uh, are really passionate, enthusiastic about these issues. And that, uh, you know, that idea that someone said that youth are so powerful. I think youth know that they're so powerful in the sense that they can just connect and get energized from each other. And uh, what we're doing is to have a process of meeting repeatedly with the young people, community service people, elders, over time, weekly or every other week to develop the research questions, how we're gonna ask, what the process is, so that we're very transparent. Uh, uh, as a researcher, transparency is a really great word um, uh, for me. Next slide, please. So technology is one of those things that we're using right now. And it is something that young people do use and is kind of surprising uh, given this uh, leap towards e-mental health, just how few mental health apps were originated with youth in mind. Um, and uh, these reviews uh, are available and it, it just shows that there's not that much done for you specifically or has done enough research for us to say, yeah, this really is uh, reflective, youth really use it, they like it, etc. cetera. Um, so the idea of a need for research is that it is there, it's ongoing. Next slide, please. 
So we come to the, the Joy Pop app. Um, and what we've really honed on uh, into is this idea that, you know, everyone can use a little bit of support in managing feelings. Um, and uh, if you can uh, feel that feeling and still do your thing that you need to, or take the time to self-care, um, that keeps you having the sense that, you know, your life is, is, is not chaotic for you. You have that mindset of, you know, moving forward. And so we focused on positive action within this, because if you think about it, a lot of apps might ask you about your negative mood and want you to track a chart of negative mood. But how helpful is it to you to know that your depression uh, ratings are like flat over time or worse, you know, or that they're increasing over time. That's not really helpful information to you. So we want to orient you to pauses because when we're really stressed, it's a well-known fact that when we're really stressed, we kind of get tunnel vision and we can't, um, you know, we're de dealing with what we need to deal with right away. And it's not so much about like stopping and smelling the roses. So that things that are really positive in your environment that might be going on, you just attention wise don't pick up because stress just, that's what it does. It narrows your um, focus of attention. So you might have to do fight, flight, faint, um, those kinds of uh, quick reactions. So we want to be sure, um, thanks, uh, to be trauma informed. If we could just go back to that, sorry, that slide. Thanks, Hannah. Um, so we have these six activities, which on your right, you can see say that see that it says happiness starts with you, which means you have personal agency in terms of uh, feeling happy mood. Um, and this the actual features include deep breathing. So this is something that we don't, I mean, we're born breathing right away. It's a skill we, we have, but when you use it purposefully, in uh to you know calm straight stress or energize you then you're really um doing it like an intervention for yourself even though you're not you're going to be breathing regardless you kind of your body does that a tetris like game we have there's a lot of research on tetris being really helpful for trauma symptoms uh journaling is part of you know different ways of expressing whether you want to do emojis or use your microphone um, we give uh, self-compassion prompts because our research showed that if you increase your, you know, the linkage was higher self-compassion had uh, lower depression or anxiety, also substance use and suicidality. So that self-compassion we learned from research was really important um, uh, as well as connecting uh, with people who are safe and uh, we have on the right, you can see an art um, a screen where you could just doodle or do X's and O's. And then I'll just focus on uh, mood ratings. And our next, our, what we're working with water is to use water in an ease to sleep kind of feature. So the next slide. So safe social connecting is just saying, you know, it's important to know who you can call and who will pick up the phone. And they may be a professional or community helper, family or friend, and we're adding a category of elder, mentor, or community member. And it just means that right there in the app, you can go and phone someone. You, if you don't get them, you'll come back into the app and you can do activities. Yeah, this, uh, this idea is very similar. And I think it's very, it's important that we have that this feature is here because we have it in our cultural um, our rites of passage program here in Six Nations and in Aquasasne and is, is in, in now like everywhere where um, I went through the rites of passage for three years um, but I was bumped up to four and like this idea is the same thing because we have aunties and uncles and we pick one auntie and we pick one uncle to be with us or two aunties and two uncles to be with us for that one year and they don't have to be biological they can be um, anybody you want to learn from and so if someone's like a good basket weaver or if someone's a good we um beater or if someone's a good hunter then 
you ask them and give them tobacco to be your and to your uncle for that year. So having that relationship for those people for that year builds your community, but also you that after you're done your four years and you have this whole community of aunties and uncles that you can go to just like it looks like on here um, that you can go to your um, uncle that you never had before and that you want to learn from and um, I think it's very important that we have those relationships and, and it's really cool to see that we have this digi digitized now where you can text them or you can send them um, let them know how you're feeling um, and you can you can let them know and you, they know like why you're having this app and they can respond to you uh, appropriately and when you are feeling down and so we build these different relationships um, mm -hmm. and yeah it's very important that we have aunties and uncles that's why we only use the language we don't have anything written down because communication is key and to have that um, other person talking to you have that um, confirmation the um, uh, the validation from a peer you know that you see speaking these things doing these things it all helps with your mental stability and it also um, uh, sort of um, brings your health back up because it uh, elightens like elates your mind a little bit it kind of a stress relief it releases a lot of different um, hormones in your body to get this uh, affirmation from uh, all these different people but I think that's uh, a key factor to why we don't read from a book you know we don't have things written down it's all through word of mouth because communication is um, the key factor to our uh, culture and a lot of um, I guess just the uh, human beings in general yeah absolutely Absolutely. And you communicate like in times of joy too. It's not just reaching out for distress. Um, and you get, as you mentioned, Dexter, that it's so much more uh, rich when you're able to hear sound with words um, and you don't want to lose that richness. So there are crisis tax line uh, for, for people who want to use that. But in this app, we, you know, it's really important to be able to talk to someone. And at the top of the corner of every app screen, we have a drop down for us uh, distress lines. If you need to have, or you want to hear like another kind of another kind of voice about what you're doing, and that also exists in the feature of the app. Um, maybe we'll go to the next screen. Next slide. And this is something that um, youth have really liked to do these mood ratings. As you can see, it's kind of like wavy. And then you would move your finger up and down to just kind of indicate how happy you're feeling is the first one. And uh, the second one is how sad. And the third one's kind of meh. It's a kind of meh day. So you just move it up and down. And, and people seem to really do like to utilize this. What our research is showing so far is that you know we ask youth to use the app for a month or 28 days and they report using it on average 20 days out of the 28 days. So that suggests that it is something that they find, everyone finds something in there that really connects to them and there's lots of different options. Um, options is an important word when you're, you are, are built, you know, boosting, looking to boost your resilience that you have multiple options. Definitely, and I think that plays into the part that you have a journaling aspect um, of the app and in there you can journal different things that you have done and journaling is different. It comes out in different ways, writing, but also in song, like you can rap, Dexter different, can rap. Different forms of expression, like dancing, singing, Absolutely. rapping, maybe even putting on a show. You know. Pierce can rap and Victor can rap. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it. I'm ready. <laughs> you already know I can sing. Yeah, I know I can sing. <laughs> you already know. <laughs> be like, <laughs> but yeah. So you go, like, you go, I mean, you go. different like journaling. I mean, journaling it comes in different forms. It's just different. It's just a different word that people. I guess it's kind of art, arty, and our people are very arty because yeah, expressive. Yeah. 
very expressive because we have dance and we have song and our language, even like the way that you um, talk um, it, is come, yeah. goes in like a wave. Um, yeah. yeah, all of those things are a passage and a collection of data and information from lineages and um, different generations from everywhere. And also like the, each individual person can put their own uh, spin and take onto it, especially with the singing, because it's your own voice that you find. Although it is the same words, the same sort of uh, cadence, but uh, it's your own voice that you're finding. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's very important yeah. for, to do those things, especially um, with the uh, whole COVID thing going on and the, um, uh, the sort of cancellation, well, not really cancellation, but the restriction of um, our ceremonies because that's what we all gather for is to help each other. That's what we all um, go to the same place. We do the same things and we give thanks to the same exact things. Cause we have, I think six um, different um, longhouses on this reservation, but all, you know, they're all just a little bit different in the way they uh, do their ceremonies, but it all means the same thing. It all goes to the same place. We're all doing the same thing is what we're giving thanks we're giving thanks that we're all still alive. You know, we're there for the creator. You know, we're not there for um, any individual, you know, um, need or anything like that. It's all um, a lot, um, there's a lot more to it than just what people see because it is, you know, a collection of data and information that's being passed generation to generation. And it's important um, that we still, you know, continue to do that, even though if it's um, at the home, you know, you still have, because the longhouse is just the spite, you know, it's just the space, you know, we are the longhouse basically, you know, like in, um, what's that movie, Guardians of the Galaxy or Thor, when they lose um, Asgard, he's like, we are Asgard, the people are still alive. And that's the first thing that's um, given thanks to in um, the Gana Han, you know, as uh, the surviving people here left on earth. So without people, you know, life basically isn't worth, you know, living, you know, you need that um, person to share that with. I think that's really important about um, human contact and um, the human um, experiences is other people to give that validation and to share those experiences with. Yeah, it's what that about? idea of the creation, what you're talking about is like, uh, we are always able to be creative and express ourselves. And when we get able to be with other people or the animals or or the uh, nature um we're able to co-create and that is uh actually when you say you might have people might be able to connect to this uh psychologists try and study this when you really feel a deep connection where you're losing that sense of time whether it's in an artwork or if you're singing that's called flow and that is deeply relaxing to you if you can get in that state of flow um, so, yeah, I, I always think it's just uh, Western science catching up with the uh, oh, yeah. hundreds and hundreds of years of indigenous yeah. science. I completely agree because within our um, teachings and um, uh, things that we basically recite every year, it's all about mental health and uh, the family dynamic and how to keep yourself uh, happy and healthy. It's all these different things that are a way of life more so than just a, um, like a, a religion, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if we go out to the next slide, I think we might be seeing what the journaling looks like. Um, oh, this is just the breathing. So it gives you some cues and it, it just kind of helps you with learning different ways of breathing. It's really techniques that, you know, um, just give you a little, a couple more strategies uh, to have. Uh, next slide. And this is the journaling. So this one asks, name a, a compassionate way you've supported a friend recently. And so you can write your thoughts, emojis, microphone it. And then the calendar saves these uh, journaling um, times so that you can go back and read it and see your, you know, what you thought then and how, you know, it just get, allows you to access that. 
And uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is some of what people have told us is that they use things like it helped them bring self-awareness about their feelings um, and they like to write about it. And if they were very anxious, you know, popping over to the games or breathing, these kinds of things might have helped. So, um, you know, we've gotten some positive feedback from young people and um, we, uh, you know, connect to young people all along the way, all along the journey of uh, developing this app. Um, and uh, I think next we might have a video if, but uh, where someone's talking about their journaling. But if there's more questions that you would like to ask, um, or you yeah. want to pop over to the video. Victor um, and Pierce, did you have any questions for um, Christine? For Christine, if you're still there, I honestly don't know if you're still there or not. Victor says he's still here. Oh, Victor, you're still here. But if you don't have any questions, we'll play the video. And we can wait till afterwards. Yeah, and then um, we have a few questions from our audience. Um, for Piers and Victor. Yeah, for Piers and Victor. And if it, any of our audience have any questions for Christine, we can, um, you can type them in now and then we can ask for them later. No problem. <laughs> We're seeing the thumbs up from Piers as well. Piers is still here. My favorite feature on the JoyPop app is the journaling option. I've always loved the idea of journaling and with JoyPop, it's been a lot easier to journal with my student schedule. Whenever I have an idea, I just grab my phone, head on over to the app and begin writing. I've mainly been using this feature at night before bed to write down my thoughts and ideas, allowing me to be more relaxed at the end of the night. Sometimes when I don't know how to start a journal entry, I look at the prompt provided by JoyPop to get my thought process going. JoyPop has made an extremely positive impact in my day-to-day -day life. Christine, you're on mute. Okay. Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, someone who's a nursing student who is, you know, finishing studies during COVID, going into the post-COVID environment. Yeah. Like I was like talking before about how mental health, how this helps our mental health. And I want to know if Victor and Pierce, um, what it was mental health like from the communities that um, you're from? Here's Victor. All right, sure, Pierce, you're, you're up I'm first. I'm down some snacks here and why I'm off camera. Um, <laughs> yeah. Mental health uh, for Inuit communities, like that's something that, uh, you know, it's sort of an inescapable reality for a lot of Inuit, right? They're sort of on our, on our smartphones and uh, in touch with what's happening down south, but don't have access to a lot of those opportunities. It's different for myself because I did grow up in the south and I had access to a lot more things, but sort of that lacking, I think, is what drives a lot of those mental health, um, you know, situations and outcomes that we, you know, too, all too often, unfortunately, hear about. Um, there's a really good movie that sort of touched upon that. And I was taking a flight out to visit my mother in Yellowknife, and I decided to toss it on. Uh, it's called The Grizzlies, um, about an Inuit community, um, Kukluktuk in the Western Arctic, and how they sort of um, actually took the creator's game, your, your game, um, and sort of healed with that from you know, all the tragedies that happen in their communities. So there's a lot of ways that um, the unfortunate realities are communicated in an effective way so that Southerners can really get an understanding of what uh, life for Inuit in the North is. Victor, do you wanna? Do you have anything to uh, add? add? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, just like Piers, I think, was saying, like he was getting at, uh, mental health is culture, mental health is tradition. And I think what a lot of people, I guess, don't understand is that um, you can't fix the mental health just by bringing in services if you don't fix the social factors uh, and the legacy of colonization that's impacting, really impacting Indigenous youth. Um, so if, I think also, you know, I'm 
as a medical student, like I'm in my psychiatry unit right now. So I'm studying depression, anxiety, social anxiety, paranoia, like hallucinations, you name it. And I think, you know, in every study they've used to teach us, uh, most clinical medicine is based off of studies on best practices that doctors should be using. But none of them, none of the studies they're basing the teachings on include indigenous peoples in them. So I am afraid that what I'm learning about mental health as a future medical practitioner may, you know, quite possibly have no bearing in my community because those studies of what, like what medicine is based on didn't include any of our people. Uh, so I think that's a huge problem. Uh, and the fact that there's, you know, really no pipelines for indigenous youth to become mental health providers. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I go back to like 400, 500 years ago, what did mental health look like in our community? I feel like, you know, it looked like going to your grandma and asking her for advice or, you know, being able to drink water out of the streams, um, not having to worry about pollution, being able to hunt. We didn't have like, you know, mental health providers the way that we think of it today. Um, so I often, I, I just question the Western mental health paradigm. Uh, because it's, it's just so exclusive of like, I feel like our realities. That def definitely resonates. And like to think of what would mental health be like a long time ago is really interesting to think about because when we all lived in longhouses, our whole like that are long as football fields of our family, then like that really puts in perspective of how we're living now and then how we used to live long time ago when when you lived with your whole family and mm -hmm. you could and they would and you have so many people that you have connections with and you cook with them and you get up with them and it's just an ongoing you're surrounded by love all the time and I think that's like a different dynamic than we are right now when we're in these nuclear homes and we're alone and nobody's there with you at night and you're all by mm -hmm. yourself in your room and it's just not a healthy environment i think um to be in those situations when we think when we compare of how we used to live a long time ago and it, yeah it's definitely interesting and um i don't know if pierce if you want to say anything you have uh, anything to add here pierce uh, yeah, well, what I'm hearing from from both you, you folks and Victor is that I think the sort of how things are approached now is a lot more individualistic. And I think that doesn't always maybe address what really needs to be addressed. I'm thinking when, uh, you know, I had this great department at McMaster, the Indigenous Studies Department, where I had a lot of support and I had this sense of community around me. And then I go to the LLC in London and there are no natives, there's no connection to culture, uh, you know. I don't have my elders around me. Um, I don't have family around me, right? These things that are sort of missing, um, I think could be better addressed in the system. And I think it's great to see folks like Victor uh, going to address, you know, these, uh, these problems from a more medical perspective as opposed to, I think, um, yeah, it's just great to see Victor doing what he's doing. Yeah, I, uh, I feel it's partly due to the Industrial Revolution because after the Industrial Revolution, people were more nuclear family oriented. Like you have your brothers, your sisters, your mom and dad, and that's it. And before that, everybody knew each other. They grew up with each other in a small village or small town of, you know, of sorts. So that privacy thing too was... Um, sort of a thing that was new to us as well, because if you go into uh, like a, a replica longhouse, there's basically no walls, you know, um, there's probably space in between each family, but the way we were set up, it was you would have your family and then across the fire would be um, your auntie and they would have the uncle come in and you would have all your cousins, you would see them every day. And that's why we're actually um, called people of the longhouse is because we would start out with our family and then we would uh, take off uh, a section of um, 
part of the longhouse and we would add on for more families to come. And that just became so on and so forth to uh, in Syracuse, um, New York, uh, near Onondaga, there's a uh, archaeological site of um, one of the biggest recorded uh, longhouses, which is 447 feet long, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's probably the size of two football fields. And what we say is that, like, imagine if you're right in the middle and you had to go bathroom real bad, you had to either run either, <laughs> either way. But, you know, uh, when you had to, you know, get up in the morning and if you had to change, you know, there was no way of hiding, you know, there was, all you would do was, you know, you would just change because it was um, like change your clothes, you know, it, there was no shame in what you had, you know, and what you were able to give, you know, so the, so, you know, Victor, to think about the, the mentality back then, you know, it was very, it was very together. It was very collective. I mean, it's kind of the same thing now that we're on reserves, but I now, just everybody, you. <laughs> now just everybody knows your business. Yeah, everybody's nosy. Yeah, everywhere. <laughs> that's yeah. culture. Yeah, infused. that's the thing. Just yeah, kidding. see, that's that that mentality state getting passed down lineage. Is we that nosiness. Been, yeah, we always like, been like this. Yeah, you got to know what other people are doing. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, oh yeah, I got some questions from the too. um from the uh the uh audience, and one here is for Pierce. Uh, what are you most looking forward to in Inuk? Or what is it, Inuvik? Inuvik. Uh, yeah, um, moving up north uh, to my to my home territory. Um, I I'm working. Um, I'm making a career shift. So right now I'm working in sort of programs and impact investing and social financing. Uh, but I where my passions really lie are well first with family. Um, I never grew up around my mom's family, so I'm really getting to know that side of who I am. Um, to be, you know, on the land of my people is what I'm looking forward to most. Um, every time I go up, you know, it's obviously very special, but it's just not the same as living there. Um, and I'm making a career shift. So I think I'm looking to, I'm moving into a job that I want to be doing long term. And, um, you know, I think it'll prepare me nicely for a PhD. Um, so that's another thing I'm looking forward to. But I'd have to say the short answer to that is is family. That's great. It's good to hear. I like those relationships are a key factor, you know, more so than just networking, you know. Yeah. Victor, do you have time to answer this question? We have one question here. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I don't have any plans to go there as of now, but I would love to go visit Piers sometime soon when it's safe. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I don't really, what? yeah, as of now, don't don't have any active plans like to be I mean, there, but I would love to. I mean, do you have any um, time to answer this question that the one audience has custom for you? Oh, for you, yes. It says, um, yes. Are you able okay. to <laughs> are you able to discuss your early experiences? Like, how did you secure um, that higher education for yourself? Like, um, your parents, support system, mentors, uh, maybe scholarship, uh, for example. Like, how were you able to really, you know, secure that grasp on that um, Harvard um, um, education? Yeah, uh, to be honest. I feel almost like it was just somewhat of a fluke. I don't, sometimes I feel like I shouldn't have made it this far. <laughs> don't like, say that. I don't know. <laughs> no, seriously. Like, I think, but I think that's the problem that, like, uh, if that most people, mo the truth is, most the, so the way that everything is set up, I feel like uh, there's not many opportunities for Native youth uh to be able to to you know like to see themselves in these positions like i didn't meet a native doctor till i was in college um so yeah me getting here i feel like it was just a series of really fortunate events and part of like that's just my truth but part of i think that inspires me to be able to try to make those steps more easier for native youth um, so that they could see it and make it more accessible. Because for me, growing up, 
I feel like I could have easily gone down the wrong path. Like I was hanging out with a lot of the wrong people. I got involved in drugs really, you know, soon in my life and doing a lot of really bad things. And I just had people who were able to mentor me um, and kind of set me straight sometimes. Uh, I saw people making mistakes. I was like, okay, I don't want to make that. Uh, yeah, just a lot of stuff. That I think I was just lucky to to maybe be in the right place at the right time. I don't yeah. think it's just luck. I think you're meant to be in those positions that you're in because it's not just the fluke that you're a Harvard medical student and it's not just the fluke that you're a co-chair for the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus. You're supposed to be in those positions and it's so important that you are sharing your story that you were worried that you were going to go down the wrong path because I think all of us have um, been in that kind of situation where we felt like that we weren't good enough or if we feel like there was absolutely no escape there's no yeah. escape or if they yeah if they like yeah you feel like you're stuck or like if you don't think your life is going to be like you never would have thought back then that you're going to be a Harvard medical student and co chair for the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus, right? So like, it's important for your story to be heard for other youth to, to know like, hey, I can fix, I can change my life and I can be in these situations just like Victor has, you know? And it's important that people hear that and it's important that you acknowledge that you're supposed to be there because, because that's what we want he, he, our youth to hear that like they're supposed to even they can get from A to B and it's gonna, you can work hard for it, but you're supposed to be there and it's possible. It's validation for our younger, for our younger people, not only for uh, younger people, you know, for the elderly as well, you know, they see that and they can see that you're carrying a lot of, um, like a lot of weight around on your shoulders, you know, no pressure or anything, you know, just kidding. But uh, no, you are really, you know, carrying a uh, bye Christine, Christine. Uh, but you are really paving a way you know you're what they would call hatahine. you're paving a way you're carving out your own spot you know you're doing things the way you're really supposed to be doing it you know you're you're in these different things these things are lining up because you're supposed to be doing it well that's um our way of thinking about it anyway you know um I'm pretty sure if you go back, you know, to your own, um, to your own reservation, you know, to your own people, they'll tell you the exact same thing. You know, you were meant to be, you know, in those positions, you were meant to do those things. And a lot of the time, um, the uh, power, or, well, I could say, like, you know, the responsibility, not so much power here is delegated to people who um, are kind of oblivious to it. Because it, it, keep, it keeps them more humble, you know. It, uh, it keeps them more grounded to think that they don't have, you know, power, you know, they don't have responsibility, even though they're just doing what they want to do. You know, there's a reasons why you like those, those certain things, you know, you're able to grasp certain concepts. You know, our people were never, you know, dumb. They were geniuses, you know, they invented everything. But yeah, I think. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Victor. Yeah. I Appreciate think that, that definitely leads into our next, um, video and it's of clan mothers at this is our grandmother's minute yeah and um yeah it's definitely important for our grandmothers to um um guide us and it's important for their words to be heard to be understood to be listened to it's the mothers of our nation clan mothers reading statement about concerns of the grand river and I hope that we have this. And if we don't have it, um, like Hannah just said that we don't have it. <laughs> so now we're gonna go into footage of the CMO's presentation, why these tools, tools are important. Are filming. Dancers and singers. VR. And these are all from uh, Six Nations, right? All the dancers and singers are they from Six Nations? You know, I don't know if we have that kind of video either. Um, Hannah doesn't seem that, but we don't have that kind of video. I don't know if we didn't discuss it. Um, 
but if you have any more um if you have any more questions at all questions at all um for any of us then we can answer them and now we're going to go into the art contests images that um our youth here in six nations um did a few weeks ago and it's about their relationship with water and what they thought about water and they're really awesome because a lot of them connect it with that we can't live without water and that water is important um to us <sighs> What video? Hannah doesn't awesome know. Video. Oh, and to, oh, well, I just want to say thank you to Pierce and Victor and Christine and Christine for coming on our show again. And we're so happy that um, you all participated. You're still doing the same things that you're doing. You're keeping your integrity intact. You're staying humble. We have the same goals, even though we're in totally different positions. And we're all doing the same thing. You know, might as well get together, talk to each other, help each other. Because like Christine had said before, you never know what can become of it. So next week, we're, we could do the, um, uh, the virtual reality tour. And next week, we'll have uh, my cousin, Gerdo Deer. And who else are we going to um, have on next week? We're going to have cool people on next week. And we're going to have Rudo Kemper. He's from the Amazon conservation team. And he is amazing. And he's hung out with people in the Amazon. He's hung out in the Amazon where they have snakes and tarantulas and all that kind of scary oh alligator stuff in the water. Boots on the ground. That's what and, I'm talking about. Yeah. So he's like super cool because he's like been around jaguars and stuff. And he knows all about that. <laughs> and he's a geographer and international, I can't say that, organizational for the Amazon conservation team. Um, and he supports indigenous with mapping their ancestral lands, which is super cool. And we want to do that here in Six Nations. Um, and uh, yeah, and he's developed an app that um, that doesn't need Wi-Fi. And he's just like, I don't know, he's just super cool. And he'll we'll be get on. into it next week. Yes. <laughs> well, now we're going to have to do the uh, closing. And it's a closing ceremony. Bring the pipes up. No, just kidding. Uh, we have a music <laughs> video. Um, and it's by a powerful female voice, Lila June, singing All Nations Rise. Art has always played a key role in revolutions. So thank you all. Indigenous people. Shine your light, we are equal. I remember the days when our prayers were illegal. I remember the days when being Indian was lethal. Yeah, we had a rough past, but get ready for the sequel. Get ready for the glorious comeback of our people. Oh, yeah. Rise up. All you warriors of love, all you answers to the prayers of our ancestors from above. I can feel it in my heart. Can you feel it in your blood? I can hear the seven fire calling us to wake up, wake up. All nations rise, rise up cause now's your time. We don't have to hide anymore cause now's the time. All nations rise, rise up cause now's your time We don't have to hide anymore cause now's the time With forgiveness as my bow and my prayers as my arrows Pull them back and let go, I watch them fly like sparrows Have hope yeah, I have hope With compassion as my shield and faith Down to my marrow I will walk the pollen path Even when it gets narrow Yeah, yeah, I Resurrect Yes, you can bet 
that we seen the single mama raising children on the rest we seen domestic violence tear apart what we have left we seen the alcohol take it all and leave us dead we seen the children take their lives when they can't take the dread anymore it's a war can't take the dread anymore it's a war. no we can't take the dread anymore it's a war. No, we can't take the dread anymore. It's a, yeah. it's a war, but we've seen it all before. And now we know we can change it, cause that's why we were born. We know we are the ones that we have been waiting for. We are the ones Grandma has been praying for. So rise up. All you warriors of love, all you answers to the prayers of our ancestors from above. I can feel it in my heart, can you feel it in your blood? I can hear the seven fire calling us to wake up, wake up. Pueblo hermoso, levántense, es nuestro tiempo. No tienes que esconderte más, ahora es nuestro tiempo. Mujer indígena. Tú eres tan sagrada, traigas medicina de tu suelo todavía. A pesar del abuso de tu cuerpo y tu tierra, respetamos tus ancestros y la suya cultura. Hombre indígena, tú eres honorable y yo veo la fuerza que todavía sobrevive. A pesar del abuso de tu raza venerable, yo respeto tus ritos, tus danzas, tus padres. Somos guerreros del amor y guerreros de la paz. Si sí, no vamos a escondernos más, somos guerreros del amor y guerreros de la paz. Si sí, no vamos a escondernos más. They say that history is written by the victors, but how can there be a victor when the war isn't over? The battle has only just begun, and Creator is sending his very best warriors. And this time, it isn't Indians versus cowboys. No, this time, it is all the beautiful races of humanity together on the same side, and we are fighting to replace our fear with love. And this time, bullets, arrows, and cannonballs won't save us. The only weapons that are useful in this battle are the weapons of truth, faith, and compassion. That was awesome. I think we're offline now. Oh, we're not offline. Thank <laughs> you, everybody, for ha who has um, tuned in. Tuned in. And I mean, continues we'll to tune in. Thank you. Be back next week at the same time, six, same place, same channel. You know what I mean. Same people. Yeah. Not same people, just us, actually. Just us, same people. All right. Thank you. Now, bye. We're out of here.